Hey guys, it's Kim aka Spartan Stitcher back again with another weekly cross stitching update. Today is the 17th of May 2021. This is video number 121 and I worked on three different pieces this week. I am congested with a weak, weak voice because I do have a cold that I caught from my youngest daughter. It is a regular cold, it's nothing else. Um, it sounds worse than it is, but just the sinus drainage and stuff has made my voice weak. Sometimes if I talk a lot, it makes me cough. So I'm sorry. I'll try to, you know, st pause the video and um, not have, have you listen to that. But so three pieces this week. I kept going on Friends Forever by Ann Stokes. This is now a retired Hade since I'm doing over 10,000 10 stitches on it this month for the Bookshelf Challenge and Full Coverage Phonetics. So I finished my page. Um, since the last time you saw it, that's 4,100 10 stitches. I still need 3,800 more to finish the book. So we still have to keep going on this one. Uh, but I finished the page, gritted the next page. I worked in my parked threads. Um, so it's ready to, to go on all the, you know, big colors on that next page. So let me show you where I'm at. It's halfway in the Q-snap right now. This is 25 count Lugana, two over one 10 stitch, and that is the entire piece. I believe I'm now at about 43%. So there is the page that I have done. I'm really happy with the detail that's in there. Of course, it looks better from back here as it all comes together. And then there's about 350 stitches from all the parked threads that I worked in here. I did grid further out this way than I had to, but um, I know that the dragon's head is going to come into the next page a little bit. So as I work those colors, it'll just be easier for me to finish all those colors on the dragon's head as I get to it. Um, not sure if I'll get to it in the 3800 I have left to do this month, but uh, next month in June... We have the Ancient Adventures Weekend in Full Coverage Fanatics, and I gave you the wrong dates last video. It is the 11th through the 13th, so it is not Father's Day weekend, it's the weekend prior. And since this is my oldest whip, I'll be working on it for that weekend, along with the 3,800 more I have to do this month. So that is Friends Forever by Ian Stokes. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we're kind of busy here, but have fabric that's shedding on me. Um, I worked on Halloween Rules by Lizzie Kate. I'm doing this 28 count one over one, so teeny tiny little stitches. And I put in 1200 to uh, stitch one rule and then half of another. So there is the entire thing so far. This is Monaco that I writ dyed using Camel color. So I brought the borders down and I did the complete sit for a spell rule. And then this is the rule for brew some fun. So I have um fun. So I need to do brew and the S down here. And then there will be a little cauldron with some, some swirlies coming out, out of it. Um, so I have eight rules done, four more to go. Uh, when I work on this in June, I'll probably try to finish this one up and stitch, like do a rule and a half again um, to try to get this done and give me more time to try to fully finish it for Halloween. So that is Halloween rules. And then my daily piece. This is a summer ball of Sandy Littlejohns of Cross Stitch Arts. Again, go to the description below to get the link where to get this chart if you're interested. So, magnets. Um, the last time I showed you this was for the page finish. So I started my new page. I finished my gridding. I did not stick with my 125 stitches per day on this because I had the overage from finishing, rushing all the back stitch to finish the page for my last video. So like those last two days I had done over 200 stitches a day. So I used that slack, if you will, um, and did less than my 125 until I used up that slack and then started back with my 125 a day 
for the book that I'm doing in the bookshop challenge. So only 730 stitches since the last time you saw it. And it's a little bit of green and all this mauve curtains. And then this, all these creams and tans in here. That's it. That's all I've done. It's nothing interesting. We get to do all the boring stuff on the new page first. So we'll keep going on the background on that one for now. Working on that daily, and as I said, I still have to work on Friends Forever, and I still have more to do on my Star Wars piece. For each of those three pieces, I have now completed one word in the Wheel of Fortune uh, monthly challenge for, the, for full coverage phonetics this month, and I've started the next word. Um, I'm just using the words and combinations to get the totals close to how many stitches I have to do for the bookshelf challenge, so double dipping those stitches. Um, so I doubt I, it might be another full coverage week this, this week with a summer ball of friends forever and star Wars. Um, so we will see. And that is all of my stitching content. So if, if you're not interested in life and air force stuff or airplanes, uh, we'll see you later. Thank you for joining me. Real life updates. It's the last full week of school for my kiddos. They have two days of school the following week so they have lots of fun activities this week they're going to try to do a field day um and my my third grader their class is walking across the base to the bowling alley on base uh to go bowling but for the first time in like the amount of rain it we went from like winter to summer we haven't had any spring we've only had about 30 seconds of rain twice um, since the snow stopped and even, even the winter time, we hardly got any snow. So we are, uh, very, very high drought conditions for us. And it's finally looking like we're going to get, get some rain this week. Of course, that's going to impede, uh, fun activities at school for the last week of school and my time at the barn. But uh, who's going to complain? We need the grass to come up. Um, only the grass that's mostly in the shade all day is, is what's coming up. The dandelions are coming up just fine. Um, but most of the grass that's got the morning sun is not coming up. So we need the, we need the, we need the rain. We'll see what we get. Um, Spencer update. He finally got his antibiotics for the tick-borne diseases on Thursday and started those at dinner time. It, they were coming from a different pharmacy, still had more shipping issues, uh, but we finally got them, got them started. Um, so that was Thursday dinner time. By Saturday... He, he was improved, but still, like, not chipper. Um, but my friend still decided to take him on a trail ride. Just easy walk. Walking, you know, just stretch his legs. Not doing anything strenuous. Taking one of our students on a trail ride. And, uh, you know, he was carrying his head lower than normal when he's usually, he's up looking around at everything. Um, about a dozen ducks flushed from the grass to fly into the pond. And he couldn't care less, which is completely, um, against his personality. Normally he'd be spooking or at least flinching and, and, and jumping. Um, but then yesterday, Sunday morning, she went out to get them from the pasture to feed them breakfast. He nickered at her. He was power walking to come get his breakfast and he ate with enthusiasm. So all good signs that the antibiotics are starting to kick in. You know, he's still not playing in the fields. He's, you know, still only just walking around, but there's signs of improvement, so that's good. <clears throat> now, update on Maddie, the 11-year-old mare that I'm working with here in North Dakota. Um, so, a little bit more into her story. The owner that has her now is the original breeder. So, she had the mare that foaled and had Maddie. She sold Maddie as a weanling, so in between 6 months and 12 months of age, after she was done nursing off mom, so the owner had no idea who broke her to ride, you know, how many, how many changes of um, ownership she had in between. Because even though there's paperwork, like the, you know, breed papers, sometimes people don't, you know, turn them in and, and show the ownership changing as often as they should. She got her back about four years ago, but they were right about to PCS to a base in Europe. So then Maddie went and sat in a pasture for about three years and finally got her back 
about a year and a half ago. And um, before she got pregnant, she worked with her a little bit. The owner got pregnant, not, not Maddie. Um, she worked with her a little bit, but clients' horses take priority. When she got her back and started riding her, she would um, ride her in just a rope halter, so no bit in the mouth. Or she would ride her in a bozal, which is just like a, a stiff, stiffer piece, nose piece, um, to steer the horse instead of a bit in the mouth. More common in Western than um, English, whatever. When she finally went to put a bit in Maddie's mouth, Maddie reared up on her hind legs and like was striking out and, and trying to hurt. Um, and so over that year, worked with her a lot. And she got to the point where, you know, she's not attacking anymore. She's not being spiteful, but she still tries to evade um, getting bridles. And I knew this. So this past week, we finally got to the stage where I'm like, okay, I'm ready to see what, what is she going to be like? Because all this time, these, you know, almost, let's see, a month and a half now, I've just been doing groundwork and haven't put saddle or bridle on her. I put a bridle on her. And it wasn't this bit that I have here. It was a different bit. Um, but as soon as I picked it up and started walking towards her and she saw it in my hands and heard the jingling, she was looking for a way out. Now she was tied up, uh, but she was like, okay, let me see. Let me, she was about, about to set back and have a problem. So I'm like, okay, excuse me, untied her, took her to the round pen. Uh, working with a mare, you try to avoid a fight. Uh, mares are a little bit different working with geldings. You really try to keep that mutual respect, that good working partnership. Um, geldings, you can push a little bit harder. They're, they're more forgiving. But you don't want to piss a mare off. You don't want to make it a fight. Because if she respects you, if she likes you, she'll, she'll work hard for you. So um, it's about avoiding the fight. And I spent like 10 minutes... Not trying to bridle her, just putting this all over her head, all over her face, um, making it jingle, rubbing it all over her face, like just all over. Not trying to do anything. I put the ears, you know, this part over her ears, this is a brow band, um, with a bit on top of her nose or with a bit under her chin so her nose was coming out here. Um, so not putting it on correctly, just, and she's not head shy. She has no issues with you grabbing at her ears, putting a halter on. It's it's not the action of actually touching her ears or opening her eyes that's the problem. It's something about approaching her with the jingle. Like, whoever whoever broke her to ride did something wrong. Uh, they, they use more scare tactics than let's, you know, work, work as a partnership and get through this. So now we have to undo that. Um, so that's what I've been doing this past week. Today, I went out there this morning, and I put this thing on her. No reins, just like this. I put it on her ten times. Um, some of them, I put it on and take it immediately back off. Some of them, I put them on and just lunge her a little bit. Um, the first time last week when I put it on her, she would, uh, it was a different bit. Uh, so it didn't have these long cheap pieces. It was a loose ring snaffle. Uh, which means it was just, a, it was a big, big circle, bigger than this one. And she spent, I was lunging her, and she spent 30 minutes just opening her mouth and going, like she was trying to use her tongue to get the bit out. She wasn't biting violent about it. Um, you know, she wasn't, she was still jumping, and she wasn't jumping around. She was still lunging like she should, but it was constant half an hour of, so, like, you can't ride a horse when it's doing that. You need a nice quiet mouth to be able to direct the horse. After half an hour, she had a quiet mouth. She was just sitting there with her, with her mouth closed, just chilling. Um, and then I was able to attach the reins and I tried out, they're just, they just clip on, they're just quick little clips like that. Um, I was able to turn her head both ways. I was able to make her turn and, you know, walk and turn. I was able to make her back up. So it's not actually moving the bit that's the problem. It's not the reins that are the problem. You know, I was flinging these over her head and making sure there was no problem there. Um, it's something about approaching her to put it on. Um, 
and she's to the point now where you know she's she might take a couple steps forward or backward she'll try a different way she'll try to lift her head or uh she'll try to put her head down um she doesn't try to bite me you know i'm, I'm putting it on her this this hand is between her ears and <coughs> oh i got caught and this one is you know supporting the bit open for her mouth she's not trying to bite me or anything um so that's what we're going to keep working on depending on the weather i might actually be able to get on her this week um today after the 10 times getting getting the bridle on and off i had the bridle on i had the reins on and i was standing um right next to her like behind her shoulder with my hand over her back trying to flex her head with the reins that confused her a bit when I went to flex her head away from me. So my hand over her back grabbing the far rein and pulling around. She thought she'd have to walk when I just wanted her to turn her head. Um, so we worked through that. And that will just keep going. So that is Maddie. Air Force story. Um, before I get to the story part, I want to recommend if anyone enjoys learning more about airplanes, check out the YouTube channel 74 Gear. I will uh, link the channel below. Uh, Kelsey is a 747 pilot and he has a, a big channel. He's got hundreds of thousands of subscribers and he has a variety of videos from uh, Hollywood versus reality. So like reviewing movies and, and telling you is this legit or is this just bogus uh, for different kind of, kinds of movies. Um, there are viral debriefs where uh, people send him videos of either planes crashing or bad landings or whatever, and he'll watch it through with you and tell you what's going on, whether it was good, whether it was bad. Each of those viral debriefs, there's only one that's in like the thumbnail and the title of the video, but each video has like three actual uh, different incidents in it. Um, and then... Sometimes, you know, he can fly little airplanes too, so sometimes he'll do a collaboration and take a friend flying, they call it 7-4 Burger, where you're just going to go go fly somewhere and go get a burger and come back, uh, someone who doesn't know how to fly. And then he'll give them some stick time, uh, so that's, that's entertaining. Uh, there's some videos talking about smack between uh, flight attendants and pilots, uh, fun things, pranks, that kind of thing. Um, different conversations and stuff between air traffic control and pilots, whether one or the other messed up and telling you what happened. Uh, excuse me. So go check out Kelsey's channel. Um, he can talk about all these incidents and things in a way that even if you're not an airplane savvy person, you can understand it. So I enjoy it. It's a good entertainment. Uh, if you ever run out of Floss 2 videos, go check out his channel, 74 Gear. Okay, Air Force Story. I thought I would talk a little bit into why I like airplanes so much. Um, <clears throat> some of you have children and they watch you cross stitching and they're starting to learn how to cross stitch. Um, I'm into horses too, and my girls are starting to really love horses and really get into it. Same thing happened with me in airplanes. My dad's main hobby is radio controlled airplanes so all growing up in in our basement because the michigan houses have basements he has his little man cave his little space his shop where he would uh build radio controlled airplanes now these airplanes size wise the wingspan is about five or six feet and uh as you're building these these model airplanes you build the fuselage as one piece with the the tail section the empennage and then you build the wings as a second piece. So for transportation purposes, to get them in and out of the, you know, to put them in the truck and take them out to the flying field where he actually flies them, the, the planes are in two sections and then you put them together. They attach with different, different methods, but like screws or lots and lots of rubber bands, depending on what kind of airplane it is. And then you fly the airplane. So I grew up watching my dad build these model airplanes in the basement and then going out to the flying field with him. Um, the flying field is always away from all the subdivisions, you know, most likely farmer fields around 
and the place he flew most often was a sod farm where they grow grass to be harvested to go, you know, to you know, plant grass around new homes. So perfect location to, to fly model airplanes because it's big grassy strips. So grassy, you know, runways. And the, um, the farmer field, you know, pretty big area so that they could fly in that airspace, not bother any neighbors. And if there was a crash landing, it's pretty clear. Uh, unless, you know, they were farther out and they land in a neighboring uh, farmer's field and hopefully you try to retrieve the airplane without damaging any crops. So noise didn't bother anybody and you just got your, your flying field. Um, so I would go out there all the time with him. I didn't really fly much myself because I was, I was younger. Um, but I would, I would watch him, you know, fuel up the airplanes and they had a little gas, gas tank in them. And most of the planes were, uh, propeller driven. So they, they do make planes now with little jet engines. I don't believe my dad's ever flown one of those. Um, he is been in the process for years of building a C-130. He's actually got two different models in, in process, which that's multi-prop. Like normally his planes that he flies are, are single prop airplanes, but you fill them up with fuel, you get en about enough. Uh, flight time for about seven or eight minutes and you're using a, a radio that's about this big and it's got two sticks that come up and you just move them around and that's how you control the airplane and there's a big big antenna uh, that uses one frequency to get to the receiver unit in the airplane so you start at the prop and the, the plane is braced so it won't go anywhere you do your little you know flight control check uh, to make sure your ailerons and your, your elevators and your rudders working you take it off and so my dad flew all the time and he was also an instructor so they could uh, link two radios together with a buddy cord and train new new people that want to learn how to fly these radio controlled airplanes and it was a, a real club um, but there was a couple different guys that my dad always you know was closer friends with and always flew with and all their wives all got together and they call themselves the dorks. I don't remember why. Um, but there's the dorks and the dorkettes. And they'd have dinner parties and stuff at, at each of the houses. So I knew these people really well. Well, <clears throat> fast forward to high school, going into college. I didn't know what I wanted to do for my major at Michigan State. And um, decided to try out ROTC because you could try it for up to two years without uh, any commitment to serve. Unless you started taking a scholarship, and as soon as they start paying you money, you got to you got to serve. Well, so I did that. They paid for three out of my four years of college, and I think it was the beginning of your senior year. You get to fill out a form saying, uh, choose, listing like five places, you, which bases you'd like to go to, and what career fields you you'd like. None of them are guaranteed, but you get to list your preferences, and of course. I don't know what I want to do. Uh, I was majoring in French because I needed a non-technical degree for my scholarship. Um, and I had um, concentrations in uh, accounting and history. So my career choices were aircraft maintenance because airplanes, um, airfield ops, which is like air traffic control, again, airplanes. Um, and then I think I listed finance and I don't remember after that. Well, I got aircraft maintenance. And we knew that I was going to Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. Keep in mind, my husband was also ROTC. Uh, you know, we started dating my freshman year of college. We got engaged. We were engaged for three years. We knew exactly when we were going to get married. It was going to be after I graduated and um, commissioned, but before I went to my first base. So as you graduate and commission through ROTC, you have a month. So... College graduation on Friday, commissioning as a second lieutenant on Saturday, then you have four weeks until you need to show up at your first base. And that first move is the only one that you're like fully responsible for. They reimburse you for miles. Um, I don't even remember if we weighed all our stuff. But normally now, like after your first move, after you're, you've officially active duty, if you move any of your stuff, you get reimbursed for weight and miles. Um, 
So I drove from Michigan down to North Carolina with enough stuff in my car and my parents drove in the pickup truck with, you know, um, bed frame, dresser, um, not dresser, but like computer desk, that kind of thing. Uh, my husband was a year behind me. So we knew that I was going to, I'm getting out of, getting out of sequence. We knew that I was going down to Seymour. We knew that I was going to be aircraft maintenance. My husband was a year behind me. He wasn't graduating yet. He had another year at Michigan State. Um, and so I knew I was going to be by myself. But airplanes. <clears throat> we made the entire wedding airplane themed. So not like the wedding ceremony itself. That was just your regular wedding ceremony. We made the reception airplane themed. I've showed you guys this before. Um, this is a little toy model F-15. I got two of them. Because these were our cake toppers. So instead of a bride and a groom, um, you know, my husband was wearing mess dress. So he was in uniform for the wedding with cadet rank on. Um, and these were our cake toppers on our wedding cake. Our wedding was at the Sky Room on the second floor of our regional airport. The Sky Room has 180 degree windows over the entire airfield. So you could watch the airplanes land and take off and taxi into the terminal. Um, they've, they've since redone the terminal, so I don't believe the Sky Room's there anymore. But it was a really nice you know, little banquet room that was actually quite popular in our little region of Michigan to use for events. Um, and it just so happened, the date they had available in that month time that I had between commissioning and reporting to Seymour was May 17th. So today is our 18th wedding anniversary. It also happens May 17th was, you know, landing on a, on a Saturday and it happened to be my parents' wedding anniversary. So we got married on the same day, you know, wedding anniversary as my parents, just because that's when the Sky Room was available and it fit within our window. So I could commission, have two weeks to the wedding and then two weeks for, you know, a short honeymoon and move down to North Carolina. Um, so the wedding was airplane themed. We had the, the cake toppers. My mom bought uh, a little chocolate mold for airplanes. So we had little airplane shaped mints uh, to go around at each table. The seating chart for the reception area. You have all these li different tables. Each table was named after an airframe in the Air Force inventory at that time. So you had the F-15, the F-16, the C-130, the A-10, the C-141 at the time, which is no longer uh, active. Um, and so each table was a different airframe. So big seating chart and you say, you know, A-10 is these folks right here. And also one of the fun activities we did is we had an airplane flying contest. Um, so, you know, those little like packets of airplanes, like toy airplanes that are either balsa wood or styrofoam and you, you put the wings through the fuselage and you can fly them. Well, we bought those and we had a competition between the civilians, the modelers, so my dad and, and his, you know, RC, you know, airplane guys, and then the military folks, all my ROTC friends, um, to see who could, who could fly their, their plane the farthest. And the judge was an air traffic controller. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. Airplanes, into my blood. Everything we do is about airplanes or horses. Um, but that also, the link to Cross Stitch is because I told you my husband was a year behind me. So I commissioned and went down to North Carolina a year before him. He was at Michigan State. So our first year of marriage, we only saw each other for 30 days. And that was split up, you know, different weekends. We could get away and see each other. Um, so that is why I went to Michael's one day into their cross stitch aisle and I picked up that Teresa Winsler kit of the Guardian and that's how I started cross stitch is because my first year of active duty I was living by myself in a studio apartment going TDY for training and different things and had lots of free time to myself so that's how I started cross stitch. So that is your Air Force story also poignant right now um, I was thinking about it a lot because um, one of one of my dad's flying friends one of the wives um, unfortunately passed away this weekend very unexpectedly. So thoughts and prayers are with the three people guy, as I call them. Um, 
and his family as they deal with their loss. So I hope everybody has a good stitching week and we'll see you later. Don't forget to check out the 7-4 Gear channel uh, linked in the description. Bye guys.